Gaith Alamari is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy's Erwin Levy Family Program on the United States-Israel Strategic Relationship. Gaith is the former Executive Director of the American Task Force on Palestine. He served as advisor to the negotiating team during the 1999 to 2001 permanent status talks, in addition to holding various other positions within the Palestinian Authority. Joining Gaith today is Nadine Epstein, Editor-in-Chief and CEO of Moment Magazine, and Founder and Executive Director of the Center for Creative Change. Please welcome Gaith Alamari and Nadine Epstein. I'm so happy to have Gaith Alamari with us today at Moment Live. Gaith is a Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and um, he spoke. I've spoken to him a number of times before, and he has a great depth of knowledge about the Middle East and including the Palestinian community. And today we had some major news, and that is that we have a confirmation of the death of the mastermind of October 7th. And I want to talk to you about how does the death of this one man, Sinwar, how does it change the chances for, how does it end does it, does it help to end the cycle of violence that we're in right now? Um, does it help us? Does it bring us any closer to at least a ceasefire? Um, first of all, thank you, Nadine. It's, it's really always a pleasure. Um, you know, like, I mean, it's often said that individuals don't matter and these movements continue. And that may be right at some level, but uh, sometimes individuals make a huge difference. And Sinwar was one of these unique individuals. Um, he had what no other Hamas leader had, which is credibility with both the political wing of Hamas and the military wing of Hamas. And uh, since October 7th, he has been the guy who is basically not only making all the big political decisions for the movement uh, that relate to the negotiations, to the ceasefire, to the hostages, but also the operational decisions uh, on the ground. So he was both a political and military leader. Um, his death creates a major vacuum in Hamas, particularly that his death comes after the death of uh, the killing of uh, some other major Hamas leaders, you know, the number two and three in the Hamas military wing, the former Hamas political leader, etc. There is a vacuum. Now, uh, uh, this, I think, creates an opening, an opportunity uh, for a ceasefire. It is uh, well known that uh, Sinwar was the, most, the biggest obstacle towards reaching a hostage deal. He was someone who felt that time was on his side. So why rush uh, into it? Uh, and he was someone who was not easy to pressure because at the end of the day, he was uh, hiding somewhere in uh, southern Gaza and diplomatic pressure was the way well, he did not feel it. Uh, things have changed right now. The next Hamas leader will have to come from the Hamas uh, group that's in uh, the diaspora who are based in uh, Qatar. Uh, these are people who are uh, uh, susceptible to pressure from the Qataris, from the uh, Egyptians, both of whom are susceptible to pressure from the United States. So there is this kind of opening. But also, on the other hand, uh, openings need people who will then take advantage of them. And right now, the real question is, will Israel come up with an initiative uh, that will say, okay, there's a moment here, uh, we're going to take the initiative, uh, renew the negotiations, uh, put terms that can be accepted. So I think uh, Israel uh, created an opening. Now it's up to it to either use it or lose it. So where you're thinking that this is an opportunity right now, this is Netanyahu has now achieved so enough that he can step back and say, okay, now is the time to pursue peace. Although, <laughs> yeah, but but the question is, is, who does he pursue it with? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, um, uh, on the, first of all, on Netanyahu, he has two, uh, uh, he has two sets of uh, considerations. What you presented is absolutely, he can come out and say, and I think rightly, that look, I've got the guy who is behind it, justice has been served, Hamas has been destroyed as a military organization, they're now simply an insurgency that can be dealt with in other means, but also he has his own political considerations that relate to the survival of his coalition, many members of whom, uh, of which do not want to actually end the war. So he has to make a decision. But in terms of a question of talk to whom, I don't think that's going to be a big problem. 
I think in a week or two, we will know who the uh, next Hamas leader is, if not formally, because it could well be that they decide not to choose formally a leader. Uh, this is the way what Hezbollah is doing it right now in Lebanon. But we will know uh, de facto who is the leader. And then really the conversations will happen through the Egyptians and the uh, Qataris uh, who have very, very, uh, let's say, detailed insight into the Hamas internal dynamics. So I don't think that will be a problem. Now, you know, there are other problems potentially. For example, the new leader might not have the uh, uh, credibility to uh, control the military wing. I mean, I think one scenario is that we might start seeing splintering in the military wing. These are all possibilities. But uh, but again, the momentum has shifted and uh, at least a formal process can be started. So we have, you know, obviously we're talking about Hamas and Gaza, but there's also Hamas strong support for Hamas in, in parts of the Palestinian Authority. How does this play out? How does this impact what's going on in the PA right now? Look, uh, Hamas has been trying for a long time now to basically, uh, uh, you know, fire things up in the West Bank. And uh, they have so far failed. Yes, terror has increased, uh, but they have failed. They have failed partly because of Israeli security measures. And I have to say that these Israeli security measures have been have exacted a huge toll on Palestinian civilians. I mean, the death uh, uh, count is uh, comparable to the worst days of the Second Intifada. Yet, uh, also a lot of militants were killed, a lot of militant leaders were killed uh, there. So that's part of it. Part of it is the Palestinian Authority itself has been cracking down uh, on Hamas. But there is no doubt that this will create both anger among Palestinians in the West Bank, as well as renewed attempts uh, to fire things up. And frankly, the way it's going to work out will depend in no small measure on luck, but also uh, on whether or not the Palestinian Authority and Israel can do the necessary security steps. This is in the short term. In the longer term, though, however, if we continue seeing the, seeing the current trends where the Palestinian Authority is basically bankrupt uh, and can pay salaries, if we continue seeing settler attacks against Palestinians, if we continue to see, frankly, the Palestinian Authority having no credibility because of its corruption, etc., then it's only a matter of time till uh, things go out of control there. But in the short term, my guess, you know, famous last words is uh, things seem to be under control. Well, you've you know you've already mentioned that there's a difference between the political wing of Hamas and the military wing of Hamas, and how does that play out again in the West Bank in the Palestinian Authority? I mean, first of all, just to be clear, when I say mm -hmm. there's a difference, mm -hmm. uh, I by no means uh, mean that the military wing, uh, sorry, the political wing are moderates or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Hamas, as an organization, is committed to the destruction of uh, Israel using terror. I mean, that's that's part of their DNA. Uh, I think, uh, uh, though, they have different uh, views on how to do things. Uh, the military wing, uh, unsurprisingly, believes that uh, only the use of force can achieve that objective. Uh, the political wings, particularly people like uh, Khaled Mishal, the old-time uh, leader of Hamas, who's going to make a bid now for the leadership after Sinwar's death, they believe that you know they've got what they needed from the military from October 7th. Now they are the address that everyone has to talk to, and he wants to uh, cash in on that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really where the balance uh, lies. Uh, it doesn't really matter in the West Bank, because at the end of the day in the West Bank, the uh, military wing of Hamas is quite weak. And while Hamas is popular, among the West Bank, actually more popular in the West Bank than it is in uh, Gaza. The grass is always greener. Uh, yet, uh, they also have no political meaningful presence. Their meaningful presence right, politically right now is uh, mainly in Qatar. Have you talked to people in Gaza about what they're feeling and thinking I mean, right now? I have not. Okay. I have not. It's very hard to get in touch. It's very with hard people. to communicate with people yeah. there. Is there a concern about reprisals from the remaining parts of the military in Hamas, in, in Gaza, Hamas in, in Gaza? 100%. Um, and the reprisal can take a number of forms. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that tonight Hamas is going to try to fire uh, all of their remaining rockets into Israel. 
Whether or not they can do that, I don't know. Uh, I, I doubt it because their capabilities have really been uh, degraded. Um, the one concern, the main concern I have right now is that uh, they might uh, harm some of the hostages. I mean, whether out of revenge, you know, some junior guy who has, and they're all guys, by the way, who has, who uh, is guarding some of those uh, hostages might decide uh, by his own volition to go and kill one of them. Or it could be a political decision to kill a few hostages, uh, to send a message to Israel that uh, there was a cost to killing Sinwar. I think this is a high, uh, there's a real possibility this might happen. And that's why coming up with an initiative quickly, as soon as possible, uh, would be very important to shape the uh, uh, the dynamics. So, for example, something like right now to offer a deal, you know. And yeah. to, you know, for a ceasefire and hostages, remaining hostages being released immediately. So jumping yes. right in. And I think, look, I mean, uh, Netanyahu uh, hinted at something like this uh, in his presser earlier, in his uh, statement mm-hmm. earlier. Um, but at the same time, he said the war is going to continue. So there is still lack of clarity. And I think this is the moment to come with something bold and clear that definitely has to include uh, the release of hostages and the disarmament of Hamas. I mean, these are basics, but also should be clear that if these conditions are met, then the war is over. This will not only, by the way, play into Gaza, but this also will uh, enable some of the Arab countries to start putting more pressure on Hamas by saying, look, guys, you know, uh, now you have an opportunity to end uh, this war and to end this uh, bloodshed. So here we are. It's one little over one year out from October 7th, um, a year that changed the world and a year that seemed to push the possibility of a two state solution farther back than into future in the future than we ever had dreamt. Um, did the death has the death of Sinwar perhaps moved that timetable a little up that there's a more of a possibility to have a two state solution? You know, not thirty years from now, but maybe in a in a in a sooner timetable. I mean, uh, might have nudged it uh, a little notch, but it has not changed the major uh, calculation. And unfortunately, the major calculation today is that the Palestinians and Israelis do not trust one another. And unfortunately, because of the traumas that both have suffered since October seventh, hard to imagine how the trust will be rebuilt. It's also true that uh, the Israeli political system is uh, divided and so is the Palestinian political system. And it's very hard to see a leader on either side who can make the necessary big decisions. But what I think uh, where I have maybe, I I don't like to use the word hope because it almost feels obscene in uh, in the midst of this tragedy. But I think where the opening is, is that we're starting to see among Arab countries and in the world, a sense that uh, we need to renew our efforts to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And also an understanding that it is complicated. So I suspect once the war is over, we'll start seeing more of a push, uh, a diplomatic push, which frankly, before October 7th was just not there. Uh, We'll start seeing Saudi-Israeli normalization being linked to Palestinian uh, state or at least a pathway towards it. And I hope that we will also start seeing um, serious efforts to frankly uh, reform the Palestinian Authority and turn it into an address that is first and foremost worthy of the respect of its own public and therefore capable of reaching a deal. But this is time consuming. And in the meantime, frankly, we have a lot of our on our hands, whether it's Gaza reconstruction and all of these kinds of questions. So in a, in a, in a terrible way, it seems like uh, Sinwar's hope of putting the Palestinian Palestinian statehood and his own version of that back on the on the on the international calendar i guess um has happened people are now once again thinking about palestinian statehood um although again it it seems like it's again it's how we wish this could happen a different way. <laughs> hmm. I mean, look, uh, to be to be honest, though, and again, I mean, uh, this is a point uh, that I've yeah. actually heard uh, a lot. And on the one hand, you are right. It, mm-hmm. I mean, there's no denying that October 7th was a reminder that this issue, the Palestinian issue, can still destabilize the whole region and beyond the region, as we see. But on the other hand, I think Sinwar and Hamas's uh, vision of a Palestinian state is radically different 
from a two-state solution. For them, yes. a Palestinian state means the destruction of Israel to create a theology, a theocracy. And if we can create a, a vision that is different, if one can reaffirm, not you know, not be Pollyannish about it, but uh, reaffirm the idea that ultimately, if certain conditions are met, we'll get to a two-state solution uh, that lives uh, in peace with Israel, etc. I think reinforcing this and having this come out clearly from Arab countries, from Muslim countries, as well as the rest of the world, will be a major blow to Hamas's uh, vision. It will be a message to Hamas saying, you might have put it back on the map, but your vision of a Palestinian state is one that we do not buy. I mean, and so much of the Palestinian Authority, although people support Hamas, is not like the kind, people are not wanting the kind of life or the community that Hamas brings. I don't I mean, understand. So how does that, how, how do they, how do people reconcile that? Uh, first of all, I mean, we're all full of contradictions and the Palestinians mm -hmm. are no different. Uh, actually, one of my colleagues at the Washington Institute recently, I mean, a shameless plug here, but uh, there was a, the, the, a poll in the West Bank of the different regions. And to me, well, the most interesting one was looking at the area of Hebron. That's in the south of the West Bank, mm -hmm. where basically you saw the highest support for Hamas and the lowest support for violence. Uh, why? Because that is an area that is, you know, by, by Palestinian uh, uh, terms, that is actually quite prosperous. Uh, there are jobs, uh, etc. And I think a lot of Palestinians, you know, theoretically will support Hamas because it's standing up for the cause. Uh, there's certainly a sense of anger and revenge and Hamas is uh, fulfilling that. But when it comes down to making decisions, actual mm -hmm. decisions that impact people's lives, most people tend to be more rational. And that's one of the reasons, frankly, you know, we started by asking uh, uh, why, you know, are things going to blow up in the West Bank? I think one of the key uh, reasons why they're not blowing up is the fact that people feel that uh, they don't want to go through what uh, Gaza went through and what mm -hmm. Lebanon is going through right now. So I think, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of, uh, 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 have an abstract idea, but when it comes to making actual decisions, people tend to be much more rational. So I, I know you haven't been able to talk to anyone, but have you been reading reports about how people in the Gaza Strip are actually responding right now and reacting? I mean, not uh, not immediately now, because there's mm -hmm. been uh, a very, I mean, look, Hamas has been very brutal in uh, cracking down on any uh, dissent. Uh, we have recent cases of people for, I mean, a woman who was killed, an NGO uh, uh, activist was killed by Hamas because of a Facebook post that she did. People have been, uh, you know, uh, had their limbs broken, etc. But we look at polls, actually, and Hamas is already losing a lot of uh, popularity in uh, 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 in Palestinian uh, among Palestinians in Gaza, the people who actually have had to pay the price of uh, Hamas's murderous uh, 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 policies. The real question right now, and this is one that I know is being asked, is: mm -hmm. Is the death of Sinwar going to break the barrier of fear that many Gazans right now feel? Will this create that, or will Hamas now focus, as I, I suspect they will, primarily? on cracking down on any dissent in Gaza uh, to uh, present uh, an image of unity. But again, this is one of these moments that we just don't know how the public is going to act. But again, based on previous polls, I, I suspect that many in Gaza are not shedding too many tears. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, again, I don't understand. I mean, how well organized is Hamas still in Gaza, certainly in the military wing, or is it the political wing that's really doing the cracking down or the combination of? Um, I think, I mean, these are standing orders, mm -hmm. um, but I, but, you know, to your point, I think this is again, going to be interesting to see if they can maintain this kind of, uh, uh, discipline and cohesion that they have had. Cause again, I mean, Sinwar was the guy who basically ran everything by himself. Now he had, uh, two deputies, both of whom are still alive. One of them is his brother. And there's another guy in the Northern West Bank. And whether or not one of them can step up to fill that vacuum, I personally doubt it. But uh, these are the questions that I think we have to uh, uh, keep a close uh, uh, eye on. But no matter what, we do know that Hamas's ability to coordinate and to act uh, in a sustained way has been uh, delivered a major hit. But, you know, it's down, but it's not out yet. So 
Now, so Hamas, like his, so Sinwar's brother, um, I have heard people talking about him as a possible to succeed him. Why do you think he doesn't have, is there something unique about Sinwar that he doesn't have? I mean, yes, you know, uh, look, the Sinwar that we know today, I mean, the, the Sinwar who was killed is a product of decades of uh, of myth making as well as you know uh, he was a leader of the he was one of the founding uh, generation of Hamas uh, mm-hmm. he was not you know uh, in the first two years but he joined in the third year of Hamas he was a leader among the Hamas uh, prisoners uh, mm-hmm. when he was in Israeli jails and that is uh, seen as a major kind of status uh, uh, symbol in Hamas then he was a leader of the military wing and that in itself. Uh, and then he becomes the leader of Gaza in 2017. Uh, and all of these things came together to build this larger than life uh, character. His brother never had that. His brother has always been in the military wing. And frankly, there are a lot of rumors swirling about corruption and other kinds of misconduct that make him uh, less appealing. And he, for you know, for the other competitors, particularly those uh, outside in, in Qatar, they see him as small fry. And they have enough following and enough uh, credibility to quash him. So I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, doubtful that he will emerge. And let's talk about Iran briefly. Is Iran, will Iran respond on behalf of Hamas? I mean, obviously Hezbollah is pretty weakened. Um, but is there reprisals coming from that direction? No, uh, not on this one. Um, at the end of the day, Sinwar was never close to uh, that, you know, that close to the Ayatollah. Um, he was not killed on Iranian uh, soil, etc. Uh, but actually, more importantly than that, um, and even though Iran did by his death lose one of its main assets in the region in the same way that it lost it when <clears throat> the Hezbollah leader was killed. The thing is, you know, at this moment, this is almost a sideshow for Iran. Because Iran is awaiting the Israeli retaliation against the Iran attack that happened on October 1st of this year. Mm. Um, And uh, we know that's shaping up to be uh, something big. The U.S. is sending a THAAD system uh, to Israel. The attack yesterday using B-2 bombers and the major munition on the uh, Iranian proxy in Yemen was Mm -hmm. a message to Iran that we can get your underground facilities. So all of this to say... That right now, uh, Iran has bigger concerns on its mind than what happened to to Sinwar. Might that attack? Oh, but, but might that attack by Israel kind of be nixed by what happened today? Or no, they're separate. No. These are completely separate channels. Completely channels separate of channels. War, different se- channels of war. Different channels. Yeah, okay. I mean, ultimately they are connected because if you yeah. get a ceasefire in uh, Gaza, then that makes it easier to get a ceasefire in Lebanon, uh, mm. and that could defang one of Iran's uh, uh, proxies, etc. But for the time being, all of these tracks are going based on their own separate logic. And how does this impact the leadership of the Palestinian Authority? Is this going to, like, I mean, does this? make Mahmoud Abbas weaker? I don't know if he can be any weaker or does it, are there some new leaders who are I mean, who are kind of jockeying around him now? I mean, first of all, he, he, no, there, are, <clears throat> there are no leaders in the West Bank right now in the PA who are competing with him. There are many who would like to see him go, go so that they can get their chance, mm-hmm. but he still has full control on all of the kind of strings of power uh, there. You would think, that uh, the elimination of his biggest uh, uh, competitor would strengthen him. However, mm-hmm. he is so discredited. He is so weak. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the current polling were, was, but at some point it was 94% of the public wanted him to resign. Wow. You, you, maybe you, you can't bounce that from the, back from these kinds of uh, numbers. So I mm-hmm. think, uh, unfortunately, he is not in a position to politically benefit from this. But I think if we, again, and I go back to a point, you know, I sound like a broken record, but if we can push for a real reform process, and if we can start getting some measure of cooperation between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and that requires work on both sides of this, uh, then one can start rebuilding an alternative to Hamas. But today, unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority just is not it. Wait, two quick questions. Um, I know we're going to end soon, but I'm just, is this like Netanyahu consolidated his position in Israel in the last few weeks? Um, so are you expecting any change in government there? 
I doubt it. I mean, uh, with bringing of SAR, the numbers still don't add up. Uh, between Smotrich and Bengvir, they can still bring down the government. Okay. And my last question, I'm just wondering, you know, it's been an incredible year in the world. And is there any lesson that, you know, stays with you or that you've, <sighs> that you've learned from this year? Maybe something that surprised you or something that disappoints you or something that gives you hope? Uh, look, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to say I, I will start with the bad and maybe end with the good, I guess. Uh, the bad is it's, it's, uh, it reinforces what I've always believed, that things can always get worse in the Middle East. And unless uh, we actually have a purposive uh, effort to manage and ultimately resolve these different conflicts, they will blow up in our face in the most tragic ways. I never thought I would see anything as tragic as the last year, yet mm. uh, yet it was proof that you cannot ignore that region. Where I have, again, and I repeat what I said earlier, I don't want to use the term hope, it's inappropriate, but what I see an opening is the fact that there is an understanding now that you cannot ignore this conflict. Uh, an understanding when I go to the Gulf countries, when I go to the Middle East, but also when I talk to people in Washington, there's a sense that we cannot basically wish it away. I just hope that this sense is translated into meaningful policy. Thank you. And I thank you so much for joining us today. I would love to have you come back soon. We're going to talk about the United States and what the United States could be doing in the next time we meet. So thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank you.